it's no doubt this election cycle is going to be expensive. More expensive than we saw back in 2018 when Governor J.B. Pritzker spent $160 plus million dollars against then-Governor Bruce Rauner's $50 plus million. Dollars. It was an expensive election. Well, we're already on pace to eclipse that with the $90 million the governor gave his campaign on Friday. That's in addition to the $30 plus million he gave himself last year. He's got $114 million cash on hand. But there's speculation now with Richard Irvin, the mayor of Chicago, or the mayor of Aurora, rather, outside of Chicago, uh, he's uh, announced that he's going to run for governor as a Republican, and that could come with the backing of billionaire hedge fund owner Ken Griffin. To get some context for all of this money that's involved, I reached out to Reform for Illinois. They are a group uh, that focuses on ethics and governments, and they track uh, campaign spending. They have a website called illinoisunshine.org and I would encourage you to go check that out because they compile all of the campaign finance that happens all across the state. Uh, so I reached out to Elisa Kaplan uh, from Reform for Illinois and uh, we talked a bit about uh, some of the uh, the the implications here from just how much money's involved in Illinois politics. And we start by talking about the $90 million that uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker self-financed his campaign on Friday. Here's uh, Alisa Kaplan with Reform for Illinois. This is an insane amount of money by any standard, uh, by national standards, by local standards, by global standards. Um, we can back up here and see what happened back in 2018, which was record-breaking in and of itself. J.B. Pritzker, the current governor, put $171 million of his own money into that victory. Um, so far now, he has put $125 million. Uh, keep in mind, we're not even anywhere near the primary yet, but he's already put in $125 million into his own re-election campaign account. Uh, he spent $10 million this just this quarter, including uh, two million he gave to the state House Democrats and one million to the Democrats in the state Senate, uh, looking there to uh, prop up his his down ballot allies. Um, so we are just talking about an enormous amount of money. So with that money uh, comes influence, comes a whole host of other things, including a flood of TV ads that you're already seeing from Governor J.B. Pritzker for his reelection campaign. But the $114 million that he has on hand dwarfs all of the other candidates that are in the field right now. Uh, more from Elisa Kaplan from Reform for Illinois. Yeah, Jesse Sullivan is an interesting candidate because he came in with with millions of dollars and made a bit of a splash mostly from top from from donors most of his top donors were from california so from out of state um so you can see how how a handful of out of staters can can make an impact um but in the case of ken griffin we've got multiple reports that he's willing to spend up to 300 million dollars on supporting an opponent to jb pritzker and defeating him for the governorship so the person that he picks to back would be able to give J.B. Pritzker a real run for his money. And again, we're talking about just astronomical amounts, keeping in mind that J.B. spent $171 million on his, uh, on his election campaign in 2018. And now we have Griffin purportedly saying that he's willing to spend up to $300 million. Um, and we've got reports that they've Griffin, people with Griffin ties and uh, groups associated with him have been interviewing candidates and trying to decide who they should back. Um, latest reports suggest those could be Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin, who just declared his candidacy. And if he had that $300 million from Ken Griffin, that would just be huge for him and um, just make it very, very difficult for other candidates to get a foothold. Sharing a conversation I had with Elisa Kaplan from Reform for Illinois, a group that uh, helps kind of keep an eye on what's going on with Illinois politics and Illinois campaign spending and ethics in government, uh, and uh, talking about the enormous amounts of money, uh, a grotesque amount of money uh, that's going to be involved in this election cycle. We're not even into the the general election cycle. We're, we're only in the primary cycle, and we see this much money that's potential here. But why is it important for voters to know 
where political dollars are coming from. Here's more from Elisa. You can learn a lot about a candidate um, from where they're getting their money. Um, you can learn in the case of who's, who's funding them, who's paying to influence these candidates and why. What are they looking to get out of it? Uh, who are these candidates indebted to? Who are they going to be listening to? Uh, are they going to be listening to you, your, their constituents, their, the everyday Illinoisan, or are they going to be listening to their big donors, you know, the, the J.B. Pritzkers, the Ken Griffins, the other billionaires and multimillionaires in Illinois? What does the source of their money say about them and what their interests are? whether it's a hedge fund or a hotel fortune or, or small donors or whoever it is, what does it say about what they do or don't have in common with you? Um, do they have the same interests as you when it comes to issues that affect your everyday life, when it comes to the taxes that you pay or the services that you need? Again, it can't tell you everything, but it can tell you something really important. So it's really important for people to understand where this money is coming from, because what the money is for is to influence your choice. It's to influence who you vote for um, in those primaries and general elections. Now, a question that uh, some of you have out there uh, that you've raised here on these airwaves about, for instance, Governor J.B. Pritzker spending $170 million to get the job in 2018. Why would somebody spend that kind of money? to get a job that pays, I think, $180,000. And the governor's not even, he's not even taking that salary from my understanding. Why would somebody pay that much money? I post that question to Elisa Kaplan with Reform for Illinois. <laughs> well, you'd have to ask Governor Pritzker that. I think there's a long, not just in this country, but around the world, a long tradition of very wealthy people seeking the kind of power that high elected office can give you. Uh, I think that they, they have this money and feel that there are things that they want to do, um, and this is a, a, a really uh, vital channel for their power. They can exercise a lot of power with this money. And I think it's hard to understand for everyday people just how little money this is to people like J.B. Pritzker and Ken Griffin. Um, it's not a lot of money for them. It seems like a huge amount of money for us, but they can spend this money. It's not going to change their lifestyle one bit. J.B. Pritzker is worth $3.6 billion. Ken Griffin could buy him eight or nine times over. Uh, and so this is, it seems like a huge amount of money to us, but for them, it's, it's a drop in the bucket. And so if they want, you know, whether it's ego or, or whether uh, out of, Certainly, there are many uh, people with good intentions who want to who want to get stuff done in the world. Uh, there's lots of reasons that they could be willing to do that. And I gave uh, Elisa uh, a moment for a final word, uh, and she wanted to revisit some of the themes that she raised throughout our conversation yesterday. Again, Elisa Kaplan with Reform for Illinois talking about the big money in Illinois politics. I do want to just add something about the what this means for our democracy. I, I think everybody should be extremely concerned about this. Look at the vicious cycle that Illinois has gotten into with two billionaires. We're at the point where, yes, it, it's very distressing that, that Pritzker put $90 million of his money into his campaign account. But when you look at Ken Griffin saying that he's going to put $300 million, then how is a, an opponent, how is somebody going to fight that except with a lot of money? Um, and so we've gotten into this really vicious cycle where you've got one billionaire and you need another billionaire to counter it, or at least that's what many people are thinking right now. And it's really important for people to think of ways that we can break out of this cycle and being educated about these issues and saying, you know, I'm going to reject this, this system that anoints candidates in shadowy back rooms uh, with the, the richest people in the state deciding who's who's going to get their money. Um, I'm going to break out of that cycle and figure out how we can change this. So I think people should be very concerned about what this means for their democracy and do whatever they can to, to get involved and 
see how we can empower everyday voters instead of just sitting back and accepting this situation. Again, this is uh, some of the conversation I had with Elisa Kaplan from Reform for Illinois. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand uh, just how much money is going to be involved in Illinois politics. Uh, and she says that we need to find a way to break this vicious cycle of billionaires funding campaigns. And uh, that just, you know, it, uh, money begets money, right? And it just keeps going. So it's a vicious cycle. Well, maybe Alaska and other places that have this have an answer. Who knows? Alaska voters, they actually decided via a referendum to change their electoral process, uh, and in particular, to get away from partisan primaries. We've talked about the primary here in Illinois where it's a partisan primary, and it's a closed primary. If you want to take part in the primary coming up June 28th, you have to openly declare if you're going to grab a Republican ballot or if you're going to grab a Democratic ballot. And that's jotted down and tracked so that if you do vote in the primary, they can pull your stuff and say, hey, you voted this way, that way, and this way. Uh, they've already done that with uh, candidates vying for office right now, including Richard Irvin, uh, who's the uh, the mayor of Aurora, people pulling his, uh, his voting records and showing that he's voted for Democrats in the past. So um, what's the answer here? How do we get away from not just that cycle, but possibly the cycle of big money politics in private party primaries? Uh, but Alaska, what they did is they had a, a voter referendum that narrowly passed in 2020 that set up a different type of primary process. No longer is it going to be the party primaries. Now they're going to have uh, a, a slew of candidates on the ballot and the top four get vote getters on that primary ballot doesn't matter what party there could be three republicans and seven democrats or there can be two republicans three democrats an independent a communist party a green party an institution uh, an independent party a, a constitution party. there could be a whole but the top four vote getters go into the november election and then they do ranked choice voting from there on so that's a little bit of a complicated issue uh, but it's one that uh, says, you know, uh, uh, after four, then the top two vote getters have a runoff election and then they go on from there to pick uh, a winner. I think that's how it works. But still, it's a different way uh, than we've had uh, in, in the state of Illinois and elsewhere with these closed party primaries that Democrats and Republicans craft the law to freeze out any other candidates from getting the long runway of media coverage because we're talking Republicans and Democrats right now. Right. We're going to be talking Republicans and Democrats for months. We're not going to be talking about the independent candidates or the uh, the libertarian candidates or the Green Party candidates or the you know Constitution Party candidates or the Communist Party candidates. They don't get the type of media coverage because they're not part of the taxpayer funded private party primary process. Right. So uh, it's a, it's an interesting dilemma that we are in uh, and I, I see what kind of solutions there may be. But that would have to come from members of the state house, which are Republicans and Democrats. Uh, so you can see how you get into uh, some some conflicting uh, uh, motivations here. All right, so uh, definitely something we'll continue to uh, to highlight here on the WMAY Morning News Feed. I'm Greg Bishop. Thank you so much for.